The ancient Indic vision of life is one that is filled with compassion. It sees a oneness in the whole of creation. The separated forms of the world are considered to be maya or mithya, illusions perceived through our subjective and limited sensibilities. Our belief in our separate identity and ego is the greatest illusion. It keeps us bound to desires and attachments in the material world. It is a life of pain, as none of our illusory goals can bring us happiness. Peace and joy can only come through the shedding of our desires. All humans are aware of the pain of life in this world. Thus, this philosophy was received with open arms wherever it travelled. This philosophy also took with it the marvellous concept of deities. In the Indic philosophy of aesthetics, it is believed that the moment of the aesthetic experience is akin to the final bliss of salvation itself. Our response to beauty is seen as our perception of the grace which underlies all that there is. In the moment when we experience beauty, we are transported. For that brief instant, we have lost our material desires. We have perceived that which is beyond our illusory concerns. Accordingly, early Indic philosophy and art constantly present the beauty of sublime deities before us. Deities are personifications of ideas and qualities. The qualities such as wisdom, compassion, kindness and courage are within us. We look upon their representation in art. We focus our attention upon these till they are awakened within us. These grow and fill us completely till we become the deity. This philosophy carried in Buddhist and Brahmanical faiths spread through the whole of Asia in ancient times. Traditions of art sprang up everywhere to create sublime deities to aid us on the path to enlightenment. A vision of life was established which looked always beyond the material world to the peace which was eternal. In ancient times, India traded considerably with the Mediterranean, the Middle East, and with South and Southeast Asia. This led to a great spread of ideas. There are inscriptions of Greeks who became Brahminical and Buddhist devotees in the BC and early AD periods. A landmark in the culture of Asia was when Emperor Ashoka's daughter, Sanghamitra, took Buddhism to Sri Lanka in the 3rd century BC. The faith was accepted with great warmth in the island. In centuries to come, Sri Lanka became the centre of the earliest form of Buddhism, known as Theravada Buddhism. The earliest paintings of Sri Lanka are found in a cave high atop the massive Sigriya rock. The 5th century paintings of Sigiriya, in their graceful lines and deeply thoughtful expressions, carry forward the traditions of art seen at Ajanta. It is wonderful to see the close similarity of these paintings with the later Ajanta paintings of the 5th century. 
the figures have an inward look, which pervades the Indic art of this period. The painter's gentle touch shows us that he is filled with sympathy and compassion for humankind. These paintings come as a balm and through their lilting grace remind us that there is an end to the sorrow of the world. In the 12th century, the Indian Chola Empire covered both South India and parts of Sri Lanka. The styles of the end 10th century paintings seen in the Brihadishwar temple at Tanjavur are closely reflected in Sri Lanka. The 12th century mural paintings at Polunaruva portray the Buddhist Jataka tales. Sri Lanka has preserved and nurtured the ancient tradition of making cherished paintings deep in the hearts. The sanctity of the secluded interiors provides an atmosphere of peace, far from the clamour of the material world. The caves at Dambula have paintings from early times till the 18th century. Myanmar was a great crucible of Buddhist influences and art, which came to it over the centuries. At the end of the first millennium, Myanmar had a deep relationship with the center of the Buddhist faith at Bodh Gaya in India. In fact, in the 11th and 12th centuries, the kings of Myanmar made replicas of the Mahabodhi temple at Bodh Gaya at their own capital of Bagan. By the 13th century, with the fall of Buddhist centers in the plains of India, scholars and artists from India took refuge in the deeply religious sanctuary of Myanmar. Bagan became a sanctified place with thousands of pagodas. The inspirations for this art came both from eastern India and from Sri Lanka, which was by then the centre of Theravada Buddhism in Asia. The 12th century paintings on the inner walls of these pagodas are some of the finest and gentlest paintings of the entire Buddhist tradition. The themes are those of the life of the Buddha and the Jataka stories of his previous lives. From early times, Thailand received Buddhist influences from Sri Lanka and Myanmar. These met Brahminical traditions from contact with neighbouring Cambodia and also from the culture brought by seafaring trade with India. The culture of Thailand developed as a marvellous synthesis of the Brahminical and Buddhist influences coming from many sources. The faith of the Thai people is Buddhism and one of their strongest cultural traditions is that of the Brahminical epic Ramayana or Ramakin. The great temple of the Emerald Buddha in Bangkok represents the happy coexistence of Buddhist and Brahminical traditions. The temple is dedicated to the Buddha and it has many walls which are elaborately painted with scenes from the Ramayana. Since early times, the kings of the Tibetan plateau turned with a great eagerness and zeal to India to imbibe the sacred faith of Buddhism. The Sanskrit script was taken to Tibet to form the basis of the Tibetan script, which was created.
In the 8th century, Shantarakshita from Nalanda University laid the foundations of a monastic order in Tibet. He also appealed to Guru Padmasambhava, also of Nalanda, to visit Tibet and to help enlighten the people about the new faith. Padmasambhava, who was teaching in Kashmir, brought with him the Cham, the monastic dance of the Lamas. This dance purifies the land and drives away all evil spirits. It also celebrates the victory of good over evil, man's conquest over his ego, which binds him to negative and worldly desires. The period of Guru Padmasambhava is known as the first great diffusion of Buddhism in the Himalaya. Till today, the Guru is the most revered teacher for all Buddhists in the region. In the 10th century, King Yeshe O came to the throne of Guge, which included Ladakh, Lahol Spiti, Kinor, and Western Tibet. By then, Buddhism had declined in Tibet. What troubled the king most was that even the little practice of the faith which continued was incorrect and full of local magical rites. King Yeshe O sent Rinchen Zangpo and other scholars to Kashmir to bring back scriptures with the true knowledge of Buddhism. These were translated into Tibetan by Rinchen Zangpo who became famed for all time to come as Lutsava, or the Great Translator. King Yesheo and his successors made a chain of 108 monasteries across Guge. These were painted and sculpted by artists who were brought from Kashmir. This period is known as the second great diffusion of Buddhism in the Himalaya. These monasteries became the foundations of the Buddhist culture and art, which continues till today. Nepal is geographically very close to the cultural centers of the Indian plains. There is a great heritage of philosophy and art which Nepal has shared with India over the centuries. With the disruption of Buddhist centers in India, by the 13th century, monks and scholars took refuge in Nepal. They carried with them their greatest treasures, their valued manuscripts and paintings. From across the Tibetan plateau, Nepal also received the concepts of Kashmir Shaivism. The valley of Kathmandu was like a great crucible where the philosophical ideas from eastern India met those from Kashmir. Buddhism and Brahmanism in Nepal appear similar and there are no definite lines which separate them. Here at the Swayambhunath Stupa in Kathmandu, this Vajra or thunderbolt represents the Vajrayana form of Buddhism. Bhutan is a small mountain kingdom which has maintained its seclusion and the privacy of its tantric Buddhism. Guru Padmasambhava is believed to have descended here on the back of a flying tigress. He cleansed the land of the evil spirits that hindered the spread of Buddhism. Even today, he is the most beloved deity who is worshipped in his many manifestations and forms in Bhutan. Bhutan has preserved the sanctity of the art of religious painting 
It is the one land where paintings are, till today, made with a deep reverence and meditative care. As in the ancient tradition, the aim of the painter is not to make a work of art. It is an act of faith to represent with devotion the aspects of eternal truth. Along with caravans of trading goods, Buddhism travelled along the Silk Road from India. It went to China from Central Asia, through Pakistan, Afghanistan and Uzbekistan. Around the dreaded Taklamakan Desert is a string of oases, which are the source of life in the arid lands. These have many Buddhist caves, which mark the early progress of Buddhism and indic art to Central Asia and China. In these caves you see, of course, the image is Buddha, and a with depiction of the typical Jataka stories. I thought for a moment I was in a temple in India, because both the images of the god of the Buddha, and particularly the Bodhisattvas, and the Apsaras, the Yashkis and dancers and singers are like what we saw on the Indian temples. The names of great scholars and translators illuminate the passages of the Buddhist history of China. The most outstanding of these was Kumara Jiva of the 4th century. He was the son of a Kashmiri Pandit, Kumarayana, and Princess Jiva of Kucha. At the age of nine, his mother brought him to Kashmir, where he studied Buddhism for many years. On his return to Kucha, he translated more than 40 important Buddhist texts, including the Lotus Sutra, into Chinese. These are the most important texts of Buddhism in China and Japan till today. His grasp of the Sanskrit language and the Chinese are so perfect that his translation is so erudite and so beautiful. And even today, there are so many other you know, translations later on. But the Chinese monk, if you ask them which translation do you like, they would tell you it's Kumarajivas. And his translation, I think, even I find very enchanting. Buddhism and its art was accepted wholeheartedly all over Central Asia and China. From here, the message of the Buddha travelled further to Korea and Japan. In the far east of Asia, Japan is the most distant land which received the influences of Buddhism and Brahmanism. The philosophy of deities and aesthetics, which was developed in India, has been nurtured in Japan. More than any other in the world, the culture of Japan is deeply sensitive to the beauty of everything that is around us. The effect of peace and harmonious feeling that this appreciation of beauty brings to people is best understood till today in Japan. From 500 AD, we could develop Japanese ancient civilization through Buddhism. Buddhism means Indian uh, philosophy and art and civilizations. And we adopted and we renovate and preserved. If you visit ancient monastery in Japan, you can find very old Indian civilization. The art of Asia has been informed by a great vision of the eternal harmony of the world. It is this vision of life which shaped the grace and the forms of the deities of Buddhism. The faith travelled with its philosophy of compassion 
across Asia to create a vision that shaped the culture of a continent. <laughs>